Hi, my name is Victoria Gao, and I'm the director of the Bannister Art Gallery at Rhode Island College. I'm very excited uh, to give you a sneak preview of an exhibition that's scheduled to be in the Bannister Gallery in fall of 2021. It's titled Rhode Island Imagines Peace, and it's a carefully curated exhibition of work by metals artists who are transforming decommissioned guns into art objects specifically for the show. The exhibition will take place in the Bannister Gallery um, in fall of 2021, although it was originally scheduled for fall of 2020. Um, and we've invited a select group of metal artists uh, from all over the United States to participate in recontextualizing these weapons of destruction for new purposes of exploration and dialogue. And if I could just ask my uh, fellow participants to introduce themselves today. Uh, hi, I'm Diane Riley. I am the head of the metal smithing and jewelry design department at Rhode Island College. I'm also uh, a member of the panel that put this exhibition together along with Victoria Gao, Sarah Picard, and Boris Bally. And I'm um, excited about being, to be part of the show and um, look forward to seeing it soon. So, Lauren? My name is Lauren Delbracco. I am a uh, second year master's student at East Carolina University and alumni of Diane's um, Rhode Island College Metals Department. All right, thank you so much. And uh, we're very excited for Lauren to join us today um, and just ask a few questions about the work that she made for this exhibition, Rhode Island Imagines Peace. Excellent. So Lauren, I'll uh, ask you the questions. Um, we have a couple of questions just to get an idea of your process, um, how you approached the exhibition proposal, as well as um, the uh, art itself. Um, so my first question is, why did you decide to participate in this exhibition? And what was your approach to the transformation? Yeah, that's, uh, I, um, the, the information is, is uh, I could, I'm trying to wrap my mind around giving a simple, you know, a response to this, but it's so hard because there's so much to say. Um, so I was, I have always been drawn to what could be and what is. Um, and by that, I mean, the life we live in has always been dictated by and controlled and influenced by what surrounds us, uh, whether that be cultural or social. Unfortunately, the world we live in is tragic and life is something uh, that we do gamble with and we take chances every day. Um, if not, then our experiences wouldn't be heartfelt and driven by emotion. Um, what we do in life doesn't just affect ourselves, it affects everyone. Um, it can affect multiple areas and uh, um, you know, uh, touch so many people just outside of our inner circle. Um, so when I sit in my small apartment now in Greenville, I listen to the sirens go by and the notifications that pop up about shots being fired and I'm filled with sadness and anger. And this is a more current like reflection of my piece. Um, but I'm filled with loss and a fear. And um, when I hear these things in the news and in social media that a life was taken by another human with a gun, I um, I, I want to be, I want to be angry, you know, I want to be rageful and I want to, you know, uh, um, not let those types of uh, um, happenings, you know, uh, happen to people, you know, I want to remove that experience. I was listening to, um, an article, I was listening to an article, I was reading an article yesterday and a young boy was shot outside of his house. And um, I don't know how we got to this place in life, um, but humans are impressionable. And what we see and do, we by nature, you know, become curious and we want to reenact. Um, children are most impressionable their young minds are absorbing everything they see and hear. Um, so humans kill humans with guns and it may not always be point blank, um, but the moment that a child picks up a gun, whether it is locked and loaded, that 
weapon is is not in the possession of the owner it is in the possession of a child and that owner is at fault um as a gun owner myself and um I'm, I'm sorry not to get emotional, but I'm, I am a gun owner and I have an obligation to not just protect myself from the weapon, but to protect everyone around me from the weapon. And I must educate everyone around me with safety and how to handle it and proper storage. And um, the moment that gun leaves the store, that person is in charge of the physical being in the world, that object, you are in possession of a dangerous, dangerous object. Um, and like everything else we protect our children from, like kitchen knives and chemicals and pools and sharp corners on tables, you know, all these things are brought into the environment and yet we think a gun is an exception. Um, they are weapons of destruction and they are a responsibility and they are not a toy. So to circle back, what could be and what is, um, is that this gun, you know, uh, um, could be left loaded and unlocked in a location of a child. And what is, is that moment that that gun owner took, you know, it, that gun owner neglected their responsibilities and took the life or injured another child um, because of their neglect for the safety of the object. So what is, is every day roughly 21 children ages 1 to 17 are involved in a gun-related incident. And that was taken from the, the, the Brady United organization. So a child loses their dreams to have their own opportunities and curiosity of what could be and what is. So to dream and to do was taken by neglect of the owner. I participated in this show to confront the tough subject that a gun will not kill another human being if they are not left, if they are not neglected, if they are not carelessly stored or placed, you know, um, and you cannot neglect your responsibilities of anything. You know, it, 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 the chemicals that are in your kitchen, you know, we, we see things and we react and we have to remember that these things are not toys. Um, so I approached my transformation in a manner to connect a child's kaleidoscope with the gun to force one to look down the gun barrel, um, to feel that sense of fear um, as one bears that weight and turns the cylinder to reflect upon the moments that could be as the stones are glimmering and reflecting on the inside until it stops with a bullet. Right. So that was, that was a long answer <laughs> to your question. No, um, Lauren, I think that you answered a bunch of my questions, which is <laughs> beautiful as always. Um, I appreciate your thoughtful approach to that. And um, I'm particularly interested as well in the idea of, of safety and responsibility and children's um, role in this or children's um, involvement, not even role because they're children. Um, and I'm really intrigued with what you did in transforming it into a toy. How do you feel that by doing that, you transform that firearm? How do you, how do you think that um, your actions on the, on, on the um, object itself uh, transformed it? So I did the opposite of what you would expect I would do. You know, you would expect that I would put this gun in this big locked container with all of these chains and everything, you know, completely in parts, but I did, I wanted to do the unexpected. I, I um, wanted someone to interact with the piece. I wanted them to place themselves in the shoes of a victim. Um, and to really feel that sense of fear. Um, so my, the, the transformation into the toy was, you know, when we, um, when we look at something that is, um, that is, that is new, you know, we, uh, whether it even just be a new kitchen appliance or something, you know, we want to turn on it on and check all the speeds and everything. But for a child, like, 
they look at something and they don't know what, what it could do. And um, I wanted an adult, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that children aren't going to walk into the exhibition and pick up my piece. But for an adult who would be interacting with this piece to feel that, oh, this looks like a familiar object. I'm not sure what this does. Like, let me, you know, look at this or uh, maybe look down here or I see this colorful thing here. Maybe it turns. And that's the kind of curiosity in the, in the object exploration that a child would undergo. And we forget that, you know, they have plastic toys that look like guns, very realistic ones. And how would they know that that's just not another Nerf gun that looks like, you know, a, a, a Glock 43? They wouldn't know, you yeah. know? Um, so that is, you know, that was the, the sense of transfer. I'm not sure if I hit your question, Diane. <laughs> You did, and I was just looking to see how many others you answered, because <laughs> there were really, that was a very thorough answer, and and I do uh, see that in the work that you did, that, that uh, especially with children, they don't, they don't have the, the, their brain isn't there yet, you know, they don't understand, they know a gun fires, and they probably know it kills, but when they see something, they don't put those two things together. They're like, oh, this is cool. What can I do with it? I'm, or I shouldn't be touching this. Maybe I'll touch it, you know, and what, what, what does this do? And, and I think that you really struck that chord very um, uh, succinctly and poignantly. So um, that you definitely did. And, and, and what I would, um, and I think you already answered, um, answered this, but it was, uh, what do you see the social cultural significance of, um, of, of the way that you approached the- Right, the so um, humans are most vulnerable, innocent when, as children, like I said, and I have this on the actual box itself, um, an estimated 4.6 4. million children lives, uh, um, I'm sorry, an estimated 4.6 million children live in homes with at least one unlocked and loaded gun. And most of the children know where those guns are kept. And that's noted from the Child's Defense Organization. So um, as I mentioned, we're products of our environment. So we live in a world with violence and hate and neglect. Um, we see children being just taken off the streets and giving clothing and food, but at the cost of you know conducting violence and crime. Um, and owning a gun is an American right. I'm not gonna say it's not, and, but we abuse the hell out of that right so much. Um, we abuse a lot of things um, and owning a gun is a responsibility. And as an owner, you have to respect its capabilities. So uh, more socially and culturally, I mean, we must educate others on how to keep guns safe and away from those who are not trained and not knowledgeable. and most importantly, children. I don't care if, if, if they're champion number one of, of their gun club at age seven. I mean, they, shill, they, they, they shouldn't have that direct access regardless of, you know, their children, their impressionable, their brains are still developing. Um, and like you said, Diane, I mean, it's hard to associate, you know, they may know that, you know, a gun isn't is kind of an object that is killed and they're dangerous, but to directly relink, link everything together in its full capacity is something that is hard to fathom even for me. Um, so I guess to kind of, you know, just, uh, you know, social and, and culture, cultural, I mean, um, just being a product of your environment, you know, if we create an environment that is educational and um, I, I grew up shooting guns safely at a gun range um, as a sport once, you know, once or, or a couple, you know, a couple times a month. Um, and I don't ever want to take that away from someone um, or someone who collects them at, you know, uh, um, collects like, you know, the world war or something or other guns or, you know, this one of a kind something with the beautiful wood or whatever it may be. But, you know, uh, it's, what happens to those who aren't just collecting or aren't just recreationally using or safely, you know, storing, you know, we, we have to keep our guns unlocked. I mean, I'm sorry, unloaded 
<laughs> unloaded, unloaded, locked, uncocked, you know, keep the ammunition in a separate location, lock up the gun in another separate location in a safe and away from children where they are not accessible to it. And I think the training of all of us to get that into our society is what could really make a change to save those lives. Excellent. Well, uh, that definitely starts a larger conversation, which is what the show is about. It's to engage people in dialogue that is um, welcoming from all sides. And I think you make a beautiful point with that. So thank you, Lauren. Um, I, we just have a couple of artist questions for you. Like, uh, how do you uh, feel that this work that you've done for the Providence Imagines Peace Now show uh, is re relates to the work that you do on a daily basis as an artist? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I, so currently the work that I'm focusing on is what keeps families and friends together, um, like food. And the objects that I'm making are more intended to be linked to the brain's reward system. Um, and the pieces are narrating a story or moment that I had with my loved ones. So my gun piece directly doesn't link into my work, but it does touches on, touches on moments that um, could have been you know, stories that could have been told and experiences missed at the cost of a gun owner's neglect for the safety of others. So um, it's not something that is directly linked to my body of work or my thesis, mm -hmm. but I think that it still speaks of a, you know, a larger, a larger um, connection that, that could have been. Yeah, and I think um, just with my understanding of your work too is the sense of engagement and that art is not necessarily something to look at from afar but more to hold and to to experience and to create another level of understanding uh, from uh, the object and what the artist intends. <coughs> so, uh, I've seen all of your little things and your wonderful forms that you're making and I think you're still going through that process so I, I can see that connection um, outside of the subject matter and uh, are there any artists whose work you look at or what other um, material sources did you draw from? Um, so like when I begin most of my pieces I scribble a lot in my <laughs> <laughs> and I will pace in circles and scribble some more. And then I'm like, I want to make that movement. So my next step is to go to my partner, Nick. And I say, I want to make something that does this. And he will point me in the right direction. Say, oh, well, that's a blankety blank mechanism. And it is found in this blankety blank object. And, <laughs> and then I go on. It's, yeah. it's, and then I go on Google and I sit there for hours and I just watch my little gif, you know, move and move and move until I'm like, got it. So that's like usually my first step is I figure out what kind of interaction movement I want. And then um, I kind of start to design the piece from there. Um, my first aperture piece was inspired by Peter Ontor's aperture that he did. Um, so I, I, do, I do have to say I have looked at other artists who use movement. Um, but I, I usually don't like look and then do, mm -hmm. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, cause a lot of my designs are, are strictly, you know, based upon the mechanism. So you, sometimes I even design the whole piece to house it. Um, but I also dove right into the Imagine Peace Now book and just to see how other artists handle the material in the past, uh, ways that they connected things together. And, um, you know, the way that they uh, um, manipulated different parts and um, just to try and get understanding of, you know, what the um, capabilities are, because the gun material is really weird. So mm. I, I did look at that. And um, then I went back on Google and I, I found a lot of images of kaleidoscopes and um, then I watched a lot of uh, DIY tutorials on making kaleidoscopes just so I can 
try and understand how the prism works um, and what other people were using. So I ended up using this, um, it's like a mirror paper on the inside and it worked out really well. Um, so that was my process for, for this piece. Excellent, lovely. Well, Lauren, thank you so very much for talking to us. And again, we are uh, honored and, and really excited to have your work in the show. And as an alumni of Rhode Island College, um, we couldn't be prouder. So <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. I really appreciate all of your hard work. Um, this is not an easy subject to handle. And putting a show together like this takes very delicate um, uh, um, consideration. And I appreciate all of you getting together to put this on because it is very important. And as an artist, a member of community, an American gun owner, and all of everything else in the world, um, I am just truly grateful that these sorts of shows are happening because they're very educational, um, but it also gets gives the artist an opportunity to really explore and give this sense of emotion into the piece that um, sometimes I, I, um, I really miss. So I, I really appreciate everything, guys. I really, really do. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you both Diane and Lauren for joining me today and talking um, about Lauren's amazing work. And I hope that you, the viewer, have a chance to see the show in person in fall of 2021. So sign up for our emails or follow us on social media. We're at Bannister Gallery on both Facebook and Instagram. And you can you know, see updates about when the show will actually be on display.